The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good, good afternoon. So, so in the last lecture, we talked about uh, you know, the remarkable human brain and how it empowers our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our actions in the world, and how we began to understand its remarkable complexity, or at least grasp something of its complexity, how we understand uh, that it's essential for things like moral character and judgments, the case of Phineas Gage, to produce language to speak our feelings and thoughts uh, that's blocked in a patient like Broca's patient with, with Broca's aphasia. We talked about the fact that split brain patients show us not only that the left and right hemispheres of the human brain uh, mediate separate uh, mental abilities, but that they also ha seem to have almost independent forms of consciousness or, and they don't have to be aware of one another. And so my focus today is to say uh, we really looked at, we learned from very unusual clinical cases and I'm going to focus today on tools we have to study the typical human brain. Uh, and and what, what, what is it that we can do to understand how your brain, in, 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 you know, without having a hemispherectomy or a big stroke, how does it operate? And what are the principles of human brain function that give rise to the human mind? So, so what are the ways we can learn about the human brain? And one thing we can't do is what animal researchers can do, right? That we can't literally go inside the brain except in rare, very rare clinical situations, I'll talk about them, but that's a rare source of evidence. So there's a million ways in which we're trying to understand which part of the brain is which part of the mind, and we talked about uh, the fact that, you know, phrenology uh, was a sort of a big misstep in assigning mental life, the functions of mental life to different parts of the brain, and so we hope we can do a bit better than that. And I'm going to review with you today some of the core methods, and there's a number of them uh, uh, for studying the human brain. The reason there's a number is none of them are sort of the magic answer. All of them are limited in their own ways, and we sort of need all of them uh, to begin to grasp how your brain makes your mind. There's three huge ways in which we know how the human brain uh, is organized. Uh, lesions, injuries to the brain. Stimulation, when you're allowed to uh, stimulate the brain, rarer, but we'll talk about that. And the most common, the one you see all the times in books and magazines, uh, recording, functional MRI, EEG, methods where we record brain activity and try to understand how that relates to the life of the human mind. And so uh, we're going to go through these things a little bit and you know, show you how they're applied in some ways that I hope that, that you'll find interesting. Uh, we'll come back to many of these things as we go through the semester and as we talk about aging or child development or personality or other topics, social cognition. We'll, come, we'll use these tools to understand the brain bases of those kinds of aspects of our mental lives. So what's a big injury you can have? You can have a stroke where, uh, t where a tissue in the brain no longer receives its vascular supply that it depends on so greatly. And a lot of different things like uh, hypoxia, lack of oxygen. The brain is very sensitive to oxygen. Tumors can grow. You can have degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, and others. Epilepsy. So there's lots of different ways in which you can end up with brain injury and ultimately neuronal death. So, What's the strength of this form of evidence? Well, first of all, it's causal. We've talked about the difference between causal and correlational sources of evidence, causal ones being more powerful for scientific explanation. If a certain part of the brain is injured and you no longer can speak, you, you change your character, you no longer can make memories, we're pretty sure that part of the brain in some way is required or causal for that part of your mental life to operate. The deficits you see following brain injuries can be amazing. We talked about Phineas Gage changing his character, unable to produce language, unable to make new memories. We'll talk a little bit about patients with prosopagnosia. It's a good big word to go home on spring break, and if your parents ask you, what have you learned about, you say prosopagnosia, right? Uh, that just means a deficit in recognizing faces. Patients with prosopagnosia will be unable to recognize their own spouse by their face. They'll recognize it by their voice, by their physical movements, but not by their face. We learn amazing uh, things about the brain that, you know, until it happens, we didn't know they could happen, what people like to call counterintuitive. So we'll, we'll talk later in the course in a couple times about blind sight. Patients who say, I see nothing, but their behavior shows some part of their brain sees something. We'll talk about category-specific deficits, where patients 
all of a sudden can no longer name living things, but they can name non-living things, okay? So you wouldn't have thought of that if you didn't see that. And we get separations in the brain between different things. We talked about the difference between the left hemisphere being important for local features, the right for global, the left thinking in terms of functional things in the world, the right in terms of appearances. We talked about that already. We'll talk about other things uh, that the hippocampus is important for knowing that, knowing a piece of information, but the basal ganglia is important for learning how to do things, mental skills and physical skills. We'll come back to all of those. So it gives us a way to organize things. So much of our most solid understanding of the human brain still comes from the history of neurology and lesions. Well, what are its limitations? First, brain injuries you know, don't follow anatomical boundaries. They sort of cross over things depending on the injury. So they're not going to selectively damage one part of the brain and not touch an adjacent one that could be doing something different. People can be variable in the response. Nearby systems, if you have two things in the brain that are next door to one another, do quite different things, injuries are likely to injure them both and you will wrongly conclude, uh, have a wrong conclusion about the architecture of the human brain. Um, when we test a patient and ask them to do things after a brain injury, we don't really test the part of the brain that's not there. We really test the part of the brain that is there. People do the best they can. So uh, uh, there's secondary degeneration to an injury. There's recovery from an injury. There's compensation from an injury. When you test a patient with a brain injury, you're testing what the rest of the brain can do in the absence of one of, its, uh, part, one of its companions. And finally, it can offer limited views of normal brain function. Let me pick one, and we'll come back to this in the course. We're very interested in variation in people, individuality. What's the neurology of individuality? That's very hard to study in lesion cases because we don't see enough of a lesion. We don't have enough Phineas gauges to ask, would that injury look different if you uh, grew up in one culture or another, if you uh, were outgoing versus shy? Those kinds of things are very hard to answer, uh, uh, you know, uh, patient by patient. But we can test large groups of people with imaging and ask, what is the influence of culture on your brain organization? What's the influence of personality on how your brain's organized? And you'll see later on in the semester evidence about those sorts of things. So let's go back to Paul Broca, uh, the, the neurologist who, you know, gave the name to Broca's area because he saw a patient like this, like with Tan, that this patient had a big injury in this area and could no longer speak. And every course you ever take about the brain almost will include a discussion about Broca's area. So I'm going to uh, warp your world in a very narrow way, but just, uh, maybe a shocking way and tell you, we don't even know how to think about Broca's area once we get more scientific than that, OK? So because this is MIT, so we're willing to tell the truth, OK? So uh, some years later, Nina Dronkers did the following thing. She studied a large group of patients who are, had Broca's aphasia by behavior. That is, uh, they you know, had trouble speaking but their comprehension was pretty good. And then she made maps of their injuries, and she overlaid those maps. And she said, who has Broca's aphasia? And if you have Broca's aphasia, what's the one part of the brain that every patient with Broca's aphasia has damage to? Because these patients, what you see in these maps is, you know, some patients have damage here or here or here. But you line them all up, and you say, what's the one spot that you have to have injured to have Broca's aphasia? And it's not this area that you saw in the picture. It's this area in yellow, an area called the uh, precentral gyrus of the insula. The insula is a fascinating, mysterious little structure. You have one on the left and one on the right that runs along from the temporal lobe up to the frontal cortex. Uh, just a couple years ago, there was a paper uh, reporting that patients who had stroke in posterior insula instantly gave up, sm up smoking and never wanted to smoke again. There's huge research efforts to help people quit smoking because it's, it's such a difficult health problem, okay? These patients, it's not, nobody's doing insula lesions to help people stop smoking, okay? But it just stopped their, their smoking and their desire to smoke, just like that. Uh, this is now more f towards the front of the brain. This is not what anybody in a book or a course will tell you is Broca's area. That's out here. But it turns out this is the hot spot. And you could say, well, what about the original patient? So kind of creatively, Nina Dronkers went back, and they did an MRI of the brain of the deceased original Broca's aphasic patient, OK? They, they still had his brain. They put it in a scanner. And they ran a structural MRI. And what they found was, sure enough, he had damage way inside the, the exterior limit of his damage, as well as in white matter that connects to it. So even now, imaging evidence lets us rediscover what is the true main basis of your ability to speak. 
or its vulnerability to injury. And it turns out not to be exactly what Broca was, thought it was. See, he saw a big lesion, and he said, this is the part that matters. It turns out, as far as we understand, it's a slightly different part that he thought was just at the edge and not important. So we, we can get better even going back 150 years of imaging a brain. We don't have many of those brains around. Um, Stimulation. So you like to go in the brain and stimulate. People who do animal work will go in and stimulate a neuron and see what happens. Uh, it's rare, you, know, you only get into the patient's brain when they have something, when they have a neurosurgical procedure and they're considering a resection or removal of tissue. You can also do recordings by putting grids on top of those brains. Um, and Penfield did famous studies for patients with epilepsy, who, uh, you know, where he would stimulate and map things. It contributed a lot to our thinking about the brain, but that's a, a rare source of evidence, as you can imagine. Another one that's much more common, there's one of these devices uh, down the street uh, in Building 46, is transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. So this is one in which people are allowed ethically and responsibly to give you a virtual lesion for a few moments, okay, uh, if you volunteer to do so. So they put a, uh, a, some sort of wire, there's different configurations, uh, over your head in a targeted location. It generates a magnetic field that passes through the skull and it induces a current, and what happens is the current drives lots of neurons to fire. Turns out, this is kind of interesting, if all your neurons are firing at the same moment, in one sense, it's as if none of them work, because there's no information, right? There's a lot of different ways you could think about that. But for example, if, if on your 300-channel uh, television, you had all the channels on simultaneously on the same screen, it wouldn't be very easy to watch, okay? Something like that. All the neurons firing is pretty much wipes out the function of that area. People do, you know, do feel a little bit of a physical sensation. Uh, if you're prone to epilepsy, it's not a good idea to try this. So it does require some careful supervision experimentally. But you can do this with healthy people. And if, for example, you do it on this side of the motor cortex, people will twitch or say they felt somebody touch them. Nobody touched them, but the part of their brain that codes for touch just got turned on. If you put it on the occipital cortex, visual cortex, and you turn it on at a certain moment, you can put a word up and a word down, and the person will say they saw nothing. You'll make them functionally, cortically blind for a few moments, okay? So people have done experiments like this uh, to suppress activity, to enhance activity. Sometimes it makes people even faster, like naming pictures, and it's also been used, uh, there's still experimental studies of whether it can be helpful for treatments of neuropsychiatric disorders. So it, it's non-invasive in a sense of you're not going literally inside. Uh, you have a causal thing, because you're for turning the brain on or off. Um, it's not very well targeted. It can't go into subcortical areas, but it's a very interesting tool. So let's talk about recording brain structure for a moment. So it's really important to separate this concepts between recording structure, which is a picture of anatomy, or function, which is a picture of physiology. So there's uh, old ones, uh, angiography and things like that. I'll show you two, uh, computed tomography and MR, and a really cool measure called diffusion tensor imaging. And then there's functional measures, and we'll talk about those, EEG, uh, PET, fMRI, MEG. So here's some different images you can get from the brain. So here's what a brain would look like, roughly speaking. Uh, actually, this is a post-mortem brain. This is a cut brain. Here's the front, here's the back. It's, it's, if, you, if a brain was opened in front of you, this is what you would see. So here's an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and it's pretty good. You can, and I'll show you some more pictures in, in showing you lots of information. Not as good as if you were in there, but pretty good. Here's a CT scan, computed tomography. You know, it's not as good, it's more blurry. And this thing that looks really sad, right? It looks like, like, you know, get your camera focused, right? That's actually the quality of the picture that we see that underlies maybe the most widely used tool these days for understanding the human mind and brain, functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's a very smudgy picture but it has some really interesting properties. So here's the kind of thing you go into for an MRI, both structural or functional. Have, some of you have almost certainly been participants in research or experiments or studies. Stick up your hand if you have. Just have oh, a lot of you. OK, so you'll, you'll speak up on this. Uh, uh, is it quiet or noisy? It's super noisy, OK? So, uh, uh, you know, so you have to have earplugs in. And if you're doing, uh, this, and this is why people doing experiments with functional MRI want to do visual studies because auditory ones are tricky, so Tyler, your head TA, likes auditory stuff. It's 10 times harder to pull off those experiments, so everybody tries to do visual stuff, so you don't have the noise problem. But you get some beautiful pictures. So here's, here's computed tomography, and here's an MRI structural scan, front of the brain, the ventricles, here's basal ganglia. So you could see that with the MRI, beautifully, you can see the cortical, the difference between white and gray matter. I'm always impressed that the gray matter is just this thin ribbon. I mean, cortex really means bark. It's just like the bark on our tree. 
right? And when you look at the brain this way, look at how much white matter there is. Here's your frontal cortex. Look at all that white matter and then this thin cortical mantle or ribbon or bark that's, you know, what we think of as the smarts of language and social planning and things like that. So that's a structural picture, okay? Um, and then these pictures are sort of fun. You see them, let's see. This is uh, uh, just recorded down the street. Just, we're going to fly through your brain. Okay, here we go. Maybe. Yeah. From one ear to the other. And, and, and you get amazing resolution. It's not the same thing like being inside the brain. There's things that you don't see. We know that. Uh, but you see a lot. Isn't that cool? <laughs> uh, so um, let's examine you know, what you can see now that we, we used to have to wait only about 40 years ago. You would have to have a person die to see this. So this is a patient with Huntington's disease. We'll come back and talk about that disorder. Here's a healthy person, top of the brain. This is a caudate here, part of the basal ganglia. And you can see in a patient who's passed away, that part of the brain is completely withered away in Huntington's disease. Um, you would have to wait till a person passed away to see something like that, but with modern imaging, here's a healthy person, top of the brain, again, lining the ventricles of the caudate, and here in a living Huntington's patient, you can see the great withering of the way, some of cortex too in later stages of the disease, but especially in the basal ganglia. Here's a healthy older person, about 70 years of age, top of the brain, bottom of the brain, the ventricles. Uh, here's on the left and the right are the hippocampus, the structure we'll talk about without which you cannot learn any new fact or remember any event in your life, okay? Any new event, all right? So powerful for almost every sense of learning. And look what happens to that structure. In a same aged patient with, with Alzheimer's disease, it's virtually gone. It's greatly withered. Uh, you see it's much wider here because this tissue is greatly shrunk in the Alzheimer's patient. So we can see these kinds of changes in living people, um, uh, both for research purposes and clinical purposes. Uh, here's one that's more cheerful and uh, more reflecting your experience. So here are studies of uh, brain changes from f age four to 21. So they follow people, a large number of people at NIH from age four to 21. And what this shows is this color coding is the thickness of the cortex. And you might imagine that as you get older and smarter and go through grade school and middle school and high school and MIT college and as you head towards grad school, your brain will get thicker and thicker with cortex. It's exactly the opposite. Ever since you were about five years old, you've been shedding neurons by the millions, okay? <laughs> by the, and connections among them by the trillions. And you're still gonna do that until you're probably about 22 or 23. Then you peak and you decline and become faculty members, all right, uh, all right, all right, okay. So, uh, but that's kind of really interesting. We'll come back to this, that what happens as your brain gets smart, experienced, knowledgeable, all the differences between you now, if you're eight, 17, 18, 19, 20, and when you were four, it all goes with your cortex getting thinner. Um, and we'll come back to that and how people think about that. But let, let's see if I can get this next movie to run. So there's also an ordering, and we'll come back to this, but I wanna show you this movie. So the more blue you are, the thinner you are, the more advanced you are in terms of ultimate young adult development. Here's visual cortex, vision coming in. This is uh, somatomotor cortex, how you feel your body and how you move your uh, self. And what you'll see is as you go from age four to 21, the blue spreads, that spreading is your brain maturing in higher thought areas, okay? So we, if you, we're gonna review your life on average right now, okay? Here you go. And now you're ready to graduate, okay? All right, I mean, it's kind of an amazing story, a fantastic brain changes that move you from every, what you could do and not do at four to what you can do and not do at age 21. And you know, we couldn't see these things. We couldn't begin to see these things until just a few years ago in any scientific sense. I mean, all of these things were like miraculous sources of information. Um, so let, let's pick another thing and we'll tie it to schoolwork. And then here's, here's the structure we said, the hippocampus, so important for the formation of new memories uh, on an everyday basis, everything that's important and that you learn. So here's a fun study they took. And, let's, and, we'll, and as you hear it, think about its scientific limitation, but it's fun you know, as students to think about. They looked at students in, in medical school uh, in Germany. Um, they looked at the 
a measure of anatomic thickness of the hippocampus. Uh, before and after, they studied like crazy for a huge exam, okay, <laughs> over some number of periods. So here's the before picture uh, uh, and the after. This is the difference between the two, sorry. And what they're showing you is that be, as you study, your hippocampus got thicker as you crammed for your test, right? So, you know, will there be a day where instead of having to give you tests, we could just measure the thickness of your hippocampus and know how much you studied and you could just you know, zoom in and out of a scanner? I don't know. But one cool thing about it is it's showing you that we can see structural changes not just on a giant scale from, from when you're 4 to 21, but from some number of months of experience, we can see a physical change in your brain. Now, that's trivial for animal researchers. They can show amazing things in seconds, okay? but to see the human brain physically changing. So let's take a look at another one, uh, slightly more controlled. Let's look at two more examples. Um, London taxi cab drivers. Now, uh, if you've traveled in various cities and gone in various uh, taxis, you may have had better and worse experiences whether the taxi driver knows where he or she is going exactly. London is famous for having a very high code. Taxi drivers have to take big exams to uh, get their official taxi license, okay? So they, 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 they create a very demanding thing. And what they asked is the hippocampus, if you learn lots of roots, if you know tons of roots in London, what happens to the hippocampus is it's memorizing all these spatial roots. And when they saw the taxi drivers have uh, bigger hippocampi, and the, long, and the longer the, uh, they drove, the bigger it was. So is this a causal or correlational source of evidence? It's correlational, right? You know, so let's start with this. They have bigger hippocampi, and now, now maybe that's simply because what? Maybe somebody who's an awesome hippocampus is ready to go to be a taxi driver, right? <laughs> maybe they pass the test. They said, I'm an awesome taxi And the one who got lost all the time and was driving to the wrong airport and stuff, small hippocampus never became a taxi driver, right? So now the size of the hippocampus is the cause of your success, not the consequence. Because the longer you drove, the bigger it got, that kind of goes with that. You know, the, but we could do, they could, you could do a causal experiment this way. They taught people to juggle three balls. They practiced every day for three months. Three months juggling every day. What you see in yellow are parts of the brain. That's a statistical you know, map. Parts of the brain that significantly got thicker in three months of practice. So they could compare directly before and after. It's a causal experiment. Uh, and these are areas that are involved in visual motion. And it makes sense that areas involved in visual motion would somehow change. But the fact that we can see three months of experience change the structure of your brain is kind of remarkable in a way that we can measure and scientifically scrutinize. You might be curious if you did three months of this and you were a pretty good juggler, you're impressing your friends at parties, uh, your brain scan is different, right? Uh, what do you think happened? They followed these people up after the juggling requirement stopped. They kind of stopped most of the people. They went back, they were too busy. They would show off here and there, but that was it. They measured their brains again about six months later, and this change was gone. It came in, and it went out with the activity. Okay, it's activity dependent. So depending on what you do, you could think about every activity, you, mental and physical, that you do is constantly, slightly changing your brain. And if you do a lot of it, you're fundamentally changing it, like in these individuals. But if you stop doing it, you go right back to where you were because you're going to be doing something else. And another fun measure um, uh, that's kind of beautiful and intriguing is diffusion tensor imaging. Now, every thing we've talked about so far has been gray matter of the brain, the neurons and, and the circuits they form. We're going to turn to white matter, which is the myelinated axons that are the super uh, conducting sort of uh, uh, highways of the, of the brain. And what diffusion tensor imaging does, it shows you something about the organization of that white matter, measuring directly the movement of uh, water at very, very tiny distances. So, in, this is a cross-section of a myelinated nerve fiber. Those are the fibers that are covered with white matter that have to go some distance. And the myelin protects the quality and speed of that signal through your brain. And you can see at the level of, if you're a tiny, tiny drop of water or smaller than that, this is a pretty big bump in the road, okay? So imagine you're a little drop of water moving a little bit, and you bump up against the myelin, and you go, oh, can't go that way, and you go back this way, and you go with the flow. You go parallel with the myelin. It's hard to cross it at that microscopic scale. But we can measure that movement in areas uh, where it's highly constrained, the, the anisotropy of the water. Here's cerebral spinal fluid. Things can go anywhere. Here's where there's a lot of white matter, and the water tends to flow along parallel with the white matter just for physical reasons. It can't cross it over. And here, for example, 
is a, a statistical map comparing this measure of white matter organization between adults who either in their childhood had a diagnosis of dyslexia, reading was difficult for these individuals, or people who had typical reading development where reading was, you know, you learned to read and it wasn't particularly difficult. And you can see that in this area around the temporal parietal cortex, there's a significant difference. But when we look, we can do one more thing. These are reading scores this way. This is the measure of the white matter organization from the diffusion tensor imaging. Each of these is an individual person now. So the open dots are the people who had typical reading development. The filled dots are the people who had uh, uh, poor development. And you can see it's pretty continuous. Even in the people with the open circles who never had a problem, the better they read, the more the organization is here. OK, so this is not just a difference between good and bad readers. It's a difference between people who read, are really good readers and medium readers and poor readers, right? Continuous. So now, cause or effect. Were those of you who had three, who had awesome myelin, where you're going, reading's a snap. I love this stuff. You know? Where's war and peace, mom? Right? OK? Or, or were you like the jugglers, and you were, you were reading a lot, and you were exercising this part of the brain, and you altered its physical structure? And the answer is we don't know. How could we know? How could we know? If you, if you were a scientist and were given a pot of money to do this, how could you know? Well, yeah. Uh, the entire life of multiple people, oh, the lives of multiple people. Yeah, do a longitudinal study and start like before people read, right? And you could see, well, is it different then? You know, are the people, are we born to be big readers? Or by being big readers, do we alter the, the, connect, the architecture of our brain? You know, what's the effort and what's the talent? Or what's the predisposition at birth? And what's the time you put in in creating this part? And we don't know that yet, but you know, we have a, a place to look at that. And then you can create these kinds of beautiful pictures, and I'll say a word about this. Uh, so this is an individual person's white matter organization. So we could take this picture of you or anybody you know who wants to go on a scanner. Um, and what you, what's color-coded are in blue are fibers that are running up or down. We can't tell whether the fibers, which direction they're going kind of, but we, we can tell their, their orientations, up and down, left and right in red, up and down in blue, and green is front to back. Uh, let's see. Pretty cool, huh? I can tell you that, I'll say a word about this. Should we do that again? No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like it. But I work in this area, so. I mean, this is fantastic. This is an individual person's white matter organization. I mean, you, you know, as information is flowing around in your mind, here's the paths that it's flowing around in, as you just do anything that's interesting in your, in your feelings or thoughts. It's fantastic. I can tell you that um, uh, the, the algorithms that are used to create these maps, there's some debate about the better ones. Okay, so the last steps of this are a bit debated and a bit uh, depending on the, uh, how cool you are as a, as a visual engineer. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of things that's right about diffusion sensor imaging. So uh, it's, 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 uh, there's a lot of things that are right about it. Um, okay. So function. So uh, you know, most of all, we're interested in structure, not just for itself, but how it makes your mind do the things you can do. And when we think about different functional measures that are available to neuroscientists or psychologists, you know, we often think in two dimensions, spatial resolution and temporal resolution. How precise are we where we are? And you know, what's the time scale that we're measuring in? You know, millisecond, are we averaging over uh, many seconds, many hours? We know Mental operations, roughly speaking, occur at the millisecond level or maybe 10 milliseconds. It's, there's no answer to that, but we know lots of things happen that fast in the mind. So uh, as you look at this here, you can see that, for example, if you're in animal work, looking at size, you can get down to the synapse or the dendrite. We can't touch that in humans. We can't touch that cellular stuff. And it's not until we get up to here, you know, which is like big patches of the brain, that we can state things about people. That's why it's always going to be fundamental in neuroscience to, to sort of link the human work to the animal work, because we can't get to the neurons or anything like that in a person almost ever. All right? That has to come from animal work, where you can do invasive work. So we have to look at pretty big patches of the human brain. How about time? Well, we can get down to milliseconds in time uh, in the human brain, 
Uh, fu functional things like PET and MRI are here in the order of about se multiple seconds. I'll come back to this. But you can see all these things have strengths. Now, you don't always want to be down to a single synapse. It's not clear that we would understand much of the organization brain at the level of a synapse, okay? There's things happening in synapse, but a thing like knowledge or love or something like that, probably we can't study uh, at the level of the synapse effectively yet. Bigger units are probably more interpretable. So here's a fun one, EEGs, electroencephalography. So they put on your head some sort of a cap with electrodes, uh, and they measure uh, changes in electrical activity that are being picked up through the skull. Um, and there's, you're, you're picking up huge changes in hundreds of thousands of neurons. But you're able to do it millisecond by millisecond at the speed of thought. And the same kind of signals roughly used for EE, the same electrical signal for EEG and ERP, the evoke response potentials. With EEG, uh, you just watch it over time. So you can see these different uh, rhythms that go with a person in coma or in deep sleep, asleep, drowsy, relaxed. You can see these sort of characteristic uh, rhythms that people can measure. If you do an experiment, you can time lock these, you know, moment by moment to some stimulus or task you give the person. So here we're going to time lock these. And then you get a thing like this that says, here's a response, you know, maybe the first moment after I see a word or the second moment after I see a word or something like that. So you can time lock large electrical responses in the brain. Uh, and you get some studies like this, and we'll come back to this, but here's, an, here's a fun one in language, for example. You read a sentence like, uh, you see it, it was his first day at work, okay? That's the baseline condition in purple, not a particularly exciting sentence, okay? <laughs> Although your first day at work is actually pretty interesting, but not to read the sentence isn't, right? How about this one? He spread the warm bread with socks. And you go, socks, I'm shocked, that makes no sense at all, right? What happens is you read it, here's a in broken blue line, you go, whoa, and that's called the N400, okay? <laughs> but that's kind of cool, you know, that's 400 milliseconds after you saw that word, you said, I get it, it sucks, but it doesn't make sense, okay? So you're violating uh, uh, semantics. or you know. And then they have to do a control experiment. And, and, and a lot of psychology, and, and a, of course like this, we can't devote enough time to this, but I can tell you high quality research has, in psychology has high quality thoughtfulness like in any other field. You could say, well, maybe it's not the word socks that's bothering me, you. Maybe it's just because it's odd. Just like I'm weird, it's like a weirded out signal, okay? <laughs> it's a weirded out signal. So they do, they do this, she put on her high-heeled shoes, but they put shoes in big print that you didn't expect, okay? So now you're weirded out, but it makes sense. So what happens in your mind? You have a very different response here. So here, the meaning is wrong. Here, the size is wrong. And so you can read a person's mind in this sense, millisecond by millisecond, as they understand something like a sentence. You can do it with babies, which is pretty cute, okay? And, and, and incredibly exciting too, right? Uh, so we can measure it in a millisecond. It's very, lots of people can take doing it. It's relatively inexpensive. What's, why don't we just run around and do that? And we do that at MIT and lots of places do this too. Well, it's spatial resolution is really problematic. We don't know where in the brain the signals are really coming from. We know where the electrode is on the head, but that's picking up a lot of stuff below it. We don't know where in the brain it's coming from. You know, the way I think about it a little bit, imagine you went to a football game and you were on the outside of the stadium and you heard big cheering on the side that you knew was MIT. You might think something good happened to MIT, then you hear big cheering on the side where the Caltech team you know, is sitting in their spans, right? It, it'd be the usual Rose Bowl. And you might figure something good happened at Caltech, but you don't really know exactly what happened and exactly where it happened, right? Um, so we don't know where the signals are coming from uh, uh, in a very precise way. There's another method that's sort of very intriguing too, and we're just installing it at MIT, and you can be amongst the first generation of participants if you so choose to be. Uh, this is called magnetoencephalography. Uh, active neurons produce small magnetic fields. Uh, you can use a superconducting quantum uh, device to measure that's tiny, tiny changes in the magnetic field that are secondary to the neurons firing. Uh, these signals are, are problematic to measure because they're estimated to be 100 million times smaller than the Earth's magnetic field. The, in all these measures we have of human brain function, all of them, the signal is terrible compared to the noise. It's terrible compared to the noise, okay? And MEG might be the worst, okay? There's a number of places that installed MEG uh, and um, had to take it out because the local traffic on the road was too big relative to the difference between the Earth's magnetic field and the signal they get. Uh, signal to noise is terrible in every non-invasive human brain measure we have. Uh, but you get something beautiful. Now, any mental thought we have of any interest of any kind, we pretty much understand to be the property, not of a single part of the brain doing its thing, 
but a remarkable concert of different parts of your brain uh, playing or interacting with one another, okay? It's a symphony orchestra doing anything interesting in the human mind. And Meg can show that beautifully. So here's an individual's structural MRI that's been inflated. They sort of blown it out like a balloon, okay? So it's sort of easy to look at. And what you're gonna see now uh, from Dale and Halgren is an MEG measurement, millisecond by millisecond, of what your brain does, roughly speaking, when you read a single word. Okay, here we go. See, back and forth, back and forth. There's all this interaction, feeding forward from when you see it, feeding backward from parts of your brain that I think I know what it is, let's double check, okay? Uh, back and forth, back and forth. Let me do it one more time, because I think it's just so cool, okay? Anything interesting that your brain does is an incredibly complicated millisecond by millisecond uh, interaction between large-scale brain networks. So here we go again, reading a single word. Comes, arrives in the back of the brain, front's thinking about back, front, back, front, back, front. Ooh, we read the word, okay? All right, uh, you know, so uh, it's just amazing. And MEG, uh, uh, you know, is one of the better measures for us to see this time-based way in which your mind accomplishes things. Um, very, it's very, the strengths are, it has great temporal resolution, non-invasive. Spatial resolution is maybe better than the EEG, or perhaps better, not as good as fMRI, we'll come to that. Um, and it only can measure neurons in the cortex that are parallel to the skull, so we can't see lots of things like subcortical structures like the hippocampus. Okay, so now we're moving to the measures that you most often see, but these other ones are all help us a lot. And they, they're all derived from the following things. Sadly, for PET or fMRI, the most widely used studies to understand how your mind works, uh, we can't interrogate the neurons that compute your mind. We can't, they're off bounds to us, okay? The other measures you just saw, are based on neurons. What we have to do is we have to look for gossipy neighbors, that is the vasculature that surrounds and supports the neurons that compute the mind. And we know that the neurons require oxygen and glucose uh, metabolically to do their work, right, their cellular life. And the brain area is active, there's increased blood flow and increased energy supplies that come to that. So it's all the sort of inference by the secondary consequence of neurons doing their business. So the brain is about three and a half pounds is about 2% of your total body mass. So it has a tenfold, 20% extra demand of body oxygen. Your brain cries out for oxygen at every moment. So 2% of your body, but 20% of the oxygen demand. And it's so sensitive that only 10 minutes of loss of oxygen will, can often cause irreversible brain damage, especially in, in structures like the hippocampus. Now, the first discovery uh, uh, that blood changes that are ha going with brain changes, blood changes that are the sort of the echoes, if you will, the secondary consequence, can be measured, or, it was, is low tech compared to our current machines. Uh, this is work from Angelo Mosso in the late 1880s, and he saw a patient who had an unusual sort of malformation, so he had almost no skull here, okay? And he put on it something that measured the pressure there, and he, know, and he also measured, and what's shown here in, in red is this pressure, and as a control thing, and it's pretty clever, he uh, measured uh, pulses of blood in the forearm, so those are in, in, in uh, blue, okay? That's the control that's not just blood everywhere. And what he did is the guy's just sitting there, nothing happening, and he noticed that when the church bells rang nearby, boom, this device picked up increased pressure over this part of the head. That's pretty cool, right? It's a, it's, it has to be blood, it's not neurons, okay? It's blood, okay? Uh, but now he has the signature of mental life in your brain, the blood consequence of a thought, which is I hear the church. Then he asked the guy, does it have to be something that you hear? He says, did you make your prayers today, your Ave Maria? Again, nothing happening peripherally, but boom, as he gives his answer, a change in blood pressure there, or do math problem, boom, a change there, okay? So all of a sudden, blood changes over part of the brain become the witness to that part of the brain supporting the mental operations to do that task. And here's a PET study, it's the first way to positron emission tomography, which basically used, measured local brain activity by looking at the consequences of, uh, of uh, photons uh, disintegrating as they're measured in this sort of a device. And here's the way they use this task to discover which parts of, to map the neural organization of the human mind. So I need somebody who's comfortable, who's willing to do a task at their seat, uh, and it's just gonna be reading words or coming up with words. Okay, thanks, okay. Um, here you go, ready? Look at that, 
In our field, we call that fixation. You're just looking, okay? Just looking, all right? Good job, okay, ready for something else? All right, now just look at these things. Okay, you see the words? The technical word is reading, okay? <laughs> all right, now imagine we did one more thing with you. And actually, if you were in a PET scanner, here's what would happen. If in a PET scanner, you'd be sitting down there like that, there'd be a physician you know, in a lab coat like this, there'd be a physicist in the basement making up um, uh, some sort of a tracer they're going to inject into you every, every round of this, okay? Because uh, that, that's what they need to sort of track this. And it comes up an elevator and people take turns running down the hall with it because it has a pretty short half-life. The shortness of its half-life is what makes it you able to do these multiple measures, okay? So it's a pretty big deal process. And in fact, the, the one or two pet sessions I ever attended, you would rotate who would run down the field with a radioactive substance so you would sh share the radioactive substance, okay. Uh, uh, so anyway, so you've done that, okay. So now you've done that and you feel like, that's probably, I'm doing pretty good. So now they come and they say, are you ready for another injection? They have something, a catheter running into your arm and they inject you again. Here comes the radioactive stuff, the oxy, okay. And uh, now they're gonna ask you to read the words aloud. Present it one at a time, oops. But why don't you just read them aloud one at a time, go ahead. Okay, and they say, thank you very much, and we're gonna do one more injection if that's okay with you of radioactive substance, okay? Uh, and now we're gonna ask you to do one thing, and this is, har this is harder. As you see each word, tell us a verb that describes what you might do with that object, or what a person might do. So, go ahead, Faroe, tell us. Smell, pet, taste, right, Perfect, okay. Yeah, I can tell you that in the experiment, they present a lot of these, and a lot of subjects after a while just go use, 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 okay. <laughs> hold, 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 all right. But, but you did a good job, okay. So, uh, so here's what they say. This is just looking at something. This is looking at a word, which is reading. Now, don't forget, we're the only species uh, that ever read, okay? Uh, reading has been around in our culture only for about 700 years on any scale, and reading is an incredible thing to read a word correctly, and you saw the whole brain flicker to get it right. Uh, but now you're gonna say the word in the next condition, so you're not just looking at the word, but you're also saying it. And now, finally, you're not only saying a word and looking at it, but you're thinking about it to come up with smell or pet, right? So they say, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a hierarchy of your mind, just looking, reading, reading and talking, reading and talking and thinking. And by comparing those different conditions, we'll subtract them against each other and pull out the part of your mind that sees a word, that speaks a word, and that thinks about a word. And we'll separate those out in the brain. Um, so basically the subtraction method. Uh, so when we compare looking at fixation versus looking at words, we'll see what part of your brain discovers that it's a word, knows how to read words. Looking at words versus repeating them, we'll discover the basis of speech, uh, speaking a word versus coming up with the verb, thinking about stuff, their meaning, and, and coming up with an answer. So again, the idea is if you're saying something like, you know, pet for the cat, you're doing all these things, or you might just be reading it aloud, and we'll subtract them. Now, in both these conditions, here you saw a word and read it, here you saw a word and came up and produced a verb. You subtract these two and you end up with a statistical image like this. This is not a raw image of blood. All these figures you ever see, those are statistics of areas that differed by some statistical criterion between one condition and another. They're all statistics. They're not blood or raw blood. That underlies it, but what you see is a statistic. And here's the statistic. Now, in both of these cases, you saw the word. In this case, you simply read it. In this case, you read it in your head and you came up with a verb. What, why don't we see anything back here? Why don't we see the seeing of the word even though the seeing occurred in both conditions? Why, don't we, why isn't it visible in this brain picture? Because it's been subtracted out, okay? So always in these brain imaging experiments, for reasons I'm about to tell you, we almost always have to do some kind of subtraction, and I'll tell you why, okay? But that subtraction is very big because what you subtract out, that's the heart of the experiment, okay? Uh, your decision about what's a legitimate subtraction. And the reason we have to do it is this. Look at these two things. Here's one condition and here's the other condition. Do you see that they look pretty similar, okay? Again, signal to noise. Your brain is busy all the time, okay? Now we ask you to do something and see the difference. And the difference is very tiny by the way we measure it. It's not tiny mentally. It's not tiny in terms of the consequences for civilization and the world, okay? It's tiny because of the weird way we have to measure it, all right? So uh, I can tell you that if, if, you, if I put on an optimal checkerboard that psychophysicists have said this is super, this turns on your visual cortex, I'll get about a three to 5% change in your brain signal, 
if, it, if you wave your arm, I can get 3 to 5% signal change in your cortex here. If I ask you to do everything between seeing something and moving your lips or hand, everything about thought, emotion, memory, desire, motivation, everything that's big in our life will get something like a tenth of 1% of a signal change. A tenth of 1% of a signal change, okay? So is that, you know, Tyler's like, oh yeah, because you know, that means you have to test a lot of subjects and work 40 years on your PhD, all right? Uh, so, uh, uh, so we have to do that subtraction, because if we just take a picture of what's going on in your head, it's so much that we can't tell what's going on at all. And if we have you do something that's pretty big, like seeing like a really provocative picture, we'll just get a tenth of 1% of a signal change. So we have to do the subtraction to have a hint. And then we do one other weird thing. We don't have to, but we often do it. We want to average people to make some general statement about humanity, as far as we can do it, based on the 10 MIT students we test. Okay? Uh, and so we scrunch everybody's brain into a common space. Everybody's brain is a little bit different, like their bodies are a little bit different. We scrunch everybody to line them all up so we have a common physical space. So by the time you see this picture, it's a statistic on an average of people in most cases. But you get an amazing story which up until these pictures, uh, these some years, you know, about uh, now in the late 1980s, it was unimaginable that you could go inside a living person's brain and see what it is that allows you to hear a word in auditory cortex, to see a word in visual cortex, to move your mouth to speak, or to think what's a verb that goes with that word, okay? Unimaginable, you know, at your, okay, now I have to do the quick math, but you'll help me out. What year was, were you born in? 82? 92? I know, at my age it all blends, believe me. 92? Okay, so just a year or two before you were born, this was uh, five years before you were born, unimaginable that you could see such a picture. You know, when I was a graduate student at Harvard, and the people at Washington St. Louis University did, who did the first of these uh, and did an incredible service to the field, you know, we saw, oh my gosh, it was like landing on the moon, going inside the human brain and knowing which part of the brain endows us with, with human capacities. Um, now, we can be appreciative or we can be skeptical scientists. And we can say this. Let's pick this one. Let's compare seeing a, seeing a word like bored versus seeing a fixation. We do that subtraction and that's seeing a word. Just by common sense, what's wrong with this comparison? It's OK. It's not terrible. How, how could you control it better to understand what this part of the brain is really doing? I heard something. Well, partly it's a meaningful word versus something that doesn't mean anything to plus, right? But what else could you do, say, is different between them? Yeah. I'll ask both of you. In this case? Oh my gosh. Yes, and I'll come back to that, but let me not do that one for the moment, okay? Because that's a giant story which I can't fit in today. That's, yes, your mind could be all over the place, okay? So that's definitely the case, okay? That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Okay, that's the way I was going. The other one's great, too. Two great comments. Uh, yeah, you could say, like, maybe this is a part of your brain that goes with five things or something this big versus this big. Now, go, that's not so interesting, the part of your brain that looks at something this big versus this big, but that's just as legitimate a conclusion here, right? Uh, how about this? Five different things versus only this, right? There's a lot of different ways in which you can say, what is the mental operation that I discovered in the human brain and mind? And it all comes down to the comparison. So here's what they did to try to do a better job. They showed you you know, a more complicated thing that doesn't mean anything, a bunch of letters that you can't pronounce, a bunch of letters that you can't pronounce, but it's not a real word, and here's the real word itself. So if you want to say, what do you think this part of the mind is doing? What, is, what, is the, what part of the mind does this part of the brain allow to happen in humans and only humans on this planet? And every word you ever read only happens because this part of the brain does what it does. What is that part of the brain doing? Is it just simply responding to complicated things, five of them? No, not much. OK, a little bit, but not much. How about letters? Letters are pretty interesting, but there can't be a word by English. You can't pronounce this. Not too interested. A word, a set of letters you've never seen together before, but you can pronounce by the rules of English, boom. Right? That's what I do, says this part of the brain. By the, that's what I do. Okay? I say, I see something, and it's possibly a word, and I can say it by the rules of English. And by the way, if it's a word I've done before, I do that too. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty flexible. I can do new words. I can do words I've known before. It matches what you see with language. That's reading. That's only our species can take our visual system and the language you learn as a child 
and put them together and allow our, our civilization to read. And this is the part of the brain where those roads meet. And by the way, we talked about local and global, the forest and the trees. Uh, and consistent with what we talked about in split brain patients, if you're looking at global stuff, right hemisphere. If you're looking at local stuff, left hemisphere. So we like it when the information we have from split brain patients or stroke patients aligns with healthy people doing a task as they typically do. Because then we sort of believe there's something right about that. So, um, good. so PET, uh, pretty good spatial resolution. I mean, depends what you mean by good. Uh, my neuroscience colleagues, you know, dismiss everything we ever do as sort of pathetically <laughs> imprecise. But five to 10 millimeters, not as good as fMRI. Um, the, the temporal resolution is very poor. We can only take one picture that lasts about a minute. Um, uh, and averages everything across that. Uh, you have to inject people with radioactive stuff, uh, and, and it's correlational. Okay, but it has one other thing that's really, really interesting, uh, positron emission tomography. Because you're injecting a radioactive label, you can create different kinds of labels that go to different parts of the brain. So here's Parkinson's disease, which we know involves damage to the substantia nigra in the basal ganglia. Here's a healthy person's substantia nigra, and here's a person with Parkinson's disease where these cells have died away. Uh, typically, at least 80% of these have to die before a person shows Parkinson's disease uh, symptoms clinically. Here's an injection of a radioactive stuff using PET that binds to dopamine-receiving neurons. And you can see that in the living Parkinson's patients, there's tremendous reduction in these receptors waiting for dopamine. In a living patient, specifically dopamine receptors. So that's a disease. Here's Here's why video games are taking over the world. <laughs> oh, no, not yet. We can do one more thing, sorry. We can track a disease you know, from a, a typical person to a person with moderate uh, Parkinson's disease or severe. So not only within the disease, we can see differences of gradation. But here's why video games are taking over the world. Uh, because if we take a healthy person, uh, young adults, uh, give them this kind of dopamine binding uh, tracer and have them play a video game, two things happen. A, the parts of your brain that are involved in reward, dopamine is the strongest reward neurotransmitter that we know. Things you know, uh, go crazy, and what this graph is showing you is uh, the better you do, the more rewarded you are. This is why you will go for the next level, okay? Because to get that dopamine fixed, you gotta keep going, all right? The better you are, so, I mean, every, you know, re and we think these reward mechanisms underlie everything in many ways. They relate to everything. You know, why do you do whatever you do? Because at some level, in some way, you find it rewarding. Right? Uh, and, and, and the data is very compelling that way. The last method I'll talk about is functional MRI. And um, uh, it's the one that's obviously, you know, maybe most widely visible. So you sit in a scanner, uh, stimuli are presented to you, you perform a task. We do a lot of stuff in our lab with children. We show them you know, how the frog would do it. Uh, for those of you who've done a functional MRI experiment, because there were so many hands that were put up, do any of you want to say a word about your experience doing that? What was it like? Easy, huge fun, recommend, no, not so much fun. It'll vary a little bit. We said noisy. Some people find it claustrophobic, yeah. Oh, so they didn't ask you to do a task, maybe. Well, Who knows? For a big part of it, I was watching a movie. So, so the answer, oh, you were, okay, so the, 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 for, for the student, they, they were watching a movie and not doing anything, right? Uh, and you were, you were doing yes or no clicks. Okay, so that would be a typical functional MRI kind of experiment. Some of them are more obnoxious, some are less, some are funny, some are not as funny. You're endlessly pushing for uh, things that are, any other experiences? Was it comfortable, not so comfortable? Medium? Okay, anybody else want to share? <laughs> no, okay. Um, so how does this work? Uh, so it, um, functional MRI takes advantage of MRI, but it, but it focuses on, on, on hemoglobin, the stuff that carries oxygen in your blood. And it rests on the fact that deoxygenated hemoglobin, after oxygen has been extracted, is, uh, has, is more sensitive to the magnetic field than oxygenated hemoglobin. So it's like this. Here's, your, here's uh, basically uh, capillaries uh, and, ve and, and veins, and arteries and veins. And as, as you go through the capillary bed, the smallest uh, vessels, right, neurons are extracting oxygen to support uh, their, their physical life. What happens when this part of the brain gets active is that more oxygen is extracted to support the active neurons. So, uh, and we call this bold effect blood oxygen level dependence. So we're measuring 
The change in blood changes the ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated hemoglobins. That changes the magnetic field as we measure it, and that's what we directly measure. That's not the neurons. So if the neurons are using up oxygen, why does the volt signal increase? Why does this ratio go up? And uh, because intuitively you think it would go down, right, because oxygen is being extracted at a higher rate. But here's what happens. There's, if you look at oxygen being extracted, right after something happens, 10 milliseconds, there's a, uh, 10 seconds, there's an uh, initial dip of oxygen. That's the neurons extracting the oxygen to replenish themselves from their activity. Their activity has been to give your mind its life. Um, then what happens is there's this vast oversupply for a much longer time. You know, the, intuitively, it's as if we said, it's so important to metabolically support the neurons that make up our minds that if, we, if some area is demanding a lot of blood, we send over way too much extra as soon as we can from a distance to make sure everything's OK. All right? And because our measurement is so sad, uh, we almost can never measure this initial dip. We almost always measure the sustained oversupply of oxygen to that part of the brain. So you can say, it, it's such a house of cards, right? The oversupply of the blood going to a part of the brain changes the balance of oxygen to deoxygenated hemoglobin. That changes the magnetic property. And that's how we try to figure out what that part of the brain is doing for your mind. But it works pretty well in some cases. Um, decent spatial resolution, uh, no injection. Uh, you can zoom in a scanner and do a lot of different things. Uh, modest temporal resolution, because it's not milliseconds, it's all it's on the order of seconds. Um, and it's correlational, uh, not causal. But you get some amazing results. I'm just going to present to you two or three. Um, so here's one. Um, a thing we're very interested about humans is empathy, right? How much we understand and feel other people's uh, happiness or sadness or pain. So the observation or imagination of another person in a particular emotional state autom automatically activates a representation of, of that state in the observer. Empathy. The, uh, how do we understand how another person feels? And we think that's a big thing in how we relate to one another as humans. So uh, uh, the, Tanya Singer did the following experiment. She said, we talked about this before a little bit, embodied cognition, that we understand others out there by the feelings we know within us. We don't know their feelings, but we know our feelings inside us, right? So here's what she did. She brought in pairs of people who were uh, friends or romantic partners, OK, pretty close friends. And she either had them get some pain, it was a shock, within ethical boundary, OK, but not pleasant, OK? <laughs> That's the pain. Or you got to watch through a video camera while you're being imaged, your partner getting the shock. So think about somebody you care about and think about them getting something painful, OK? And how you would feel at that moment. And they asked in the brain, what's similar and dissimilar? And they focus on what's similar right now. Between feeling pain yourself and observing pain in somebody you care about, empathizing with the pain you see them having. And what they found is two areas, something up in the anterior cingulate and something in the insula, which we talked about before, where there was a lot of overlap. So this phrase, I'm feeling your pain, in your brain, when you feel for somebody else's pain in this physical sense, you turn on some of the same brain areas as when you feel physical pain directly. It's as if the basis to imagine another person's feelings is the feelings you know so well yourself, OK? And this is literally shown now by the brain imaging. It could have been a story, a metaphor, an argument. You know, this is scientific evidence that supports that likelihood. So we're going to expand it in a slightly fun way. Um, so there's been a lot of study about in neuroeconomics, thinking about uh, how we think about, for example, things like trust. So one game, and there's a number of them, is called the ultimatum game. Many of you probably know this, but let me remind you of this. This version of it has two players, a proposer and a responder. And what they do is they give the proposer a certain amount of money, the proposer. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the proposer is allowed to make an offer to the responder. If the responder says no, nobody gets any money. If the, and usually people offer about 50%. So let's make this concrete just for a moment. So can I, can I pick you for a second? Are you, sorry. <laughs> you, you can decline. Okay. All right. You're okay. Okay. You're right there. Okay. So imagine, imagine if uh, Tyler came over to me and gave me $10, 10 single dollars. And I said, how would you feel if I gave you five and I kept five? Would you, what do you think? Might you go for it? Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> I mean, you go, you're, I'm $5 ahead, you're $5 ahead, you know, you know Tyler uh, won't eat this month because graduate student stipends are modest, but you know, we just, you know, it's a zero sum game in the end. Right? Okay, so, uh, uh, okay, okay, so now Tyler comes over and hands me $10 more, and, uh, and I offer you one. What's your first feeling, assuming that I wasn't your teacher grading you? <laughs> uh, um, I don't know why you're you saw me get 10, and I say, here's one. What's your feeling? Uh, think about it just. You feel kind of cheated? Yeah. Now, you, you don't have to. By a purely economic perspective, are, would you be ahead by taking that dollar? Yeah. Okay, a dollar's a dollar, two dollars is two dollars, right? But people have a sense of fairness, okay? Even to their own detriment, uh, if you offered two dollars and lower, uh, even knowing that you're just ruining a dollar or two you would have gotten for nothing except saying yes, people half the time will say no, right? It's like, you are so unfair, you were saying to me, uh, I would never say this to you, you are so unfair that you know, we're gonna take us both down rather than you have the pleasure of the $8, okay? It's so unfair that my sense of fairness is, is disturbed, okay? Okay, it's kind of, it's an interesting way to think about it. Somebody, you know, imagine a friend of yours is handed $10 and they offer you half, and if you say no, nobody gets anything, okay? So you have to, it's, a, it's a trust game. So they had the people in the scanner playing this game with two people they saw in a video monitor. The two people they're playing with are set up. Okay, the person in the scanner is the real participant. The people out there they see are confederates, they're, they're play actors. And one is a fair person. Here's $5, thank you. Here's $5, thank you, okay. Here's $6, oh you're awesome, you know, we can get along. There's the, and then there's an unfair player. Here's a dollar. You go, why, why, why is this guy a jerk, right? <laughs> All right, how about $2? You go, no, no. And after a while you go, I really, the fair player was very decent. This unfair player, who you believe is part of the experiment, was a setup, okay? You're thinking, why is this person such a jerk? They're constantly getting $10 and they're constantly giving me one or two. <laughs> no, 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 thank you, all right? Now, these people, uh, now uh, you get a shock and you see these two strangers, one of whom was a wonderful fair player and one of whom was an absurdly unfair player. You see them get a shock, okay? And they had both men and women in the scanner watching these things happen. And here's what happened. And it's kind of funny, but you know, whatever. Uh, for the women, they had overlap again between the parts of the brain that turned on for in here in the insula when they got a shock and when either the fair player got a shock or the unfair player. They felt bad for both by this measure, okay? Look at the men in the study. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad if the fair guy gets it. But this part of the brain is like, yeah, give it to him. Can't you push up the voltage, you know? <laughs> I mean, it just came out this way. I don't, whether it would work that way under all circumstances, you know, all ages, all societies, other groups of men and women, don't know. But in this, in this sample, the United Kingdom, uh, uh, you know, the men had no empathy for the <laughs> It's worse than that, okay? It's worse than they had no empathy. Let me show you this. Um, if they asked to indicate their desire for revenge against, this is a behavioral response, their desire for revenge against, the bad player, okay? Now, they're not, I don't think they pursued the unfair player down the street and, you know, but just that feeling like, and the women said, ah, oh, a little bit. The men said, yes, you know, let me, <laughs> if only I could take down this person, that would be great. And here's the amazing thing. We'll come back to the structure called the nucleus accumbens. It sits in the bottom of the basal, of the basal ganglia. It's the structure that in the human brain is most identified with reward and pleasure. Most identified with reward and pleasure uh, by fMRI imaging. Look at the nucleus accumbens when the unfair player gets Zapped, okay? Uh, you're watching. The women, ah, that's not, nothing much. The men, boom, big reward. Revenge is rewarding in their brain, okay? No sympathy and lots of revenge satisfaction for the unfair player. Now, you can decide in your own life, you know, who this applies to or not, but it's kind of sort of fun, it's sort of fun to explore uh, these different things, how we form ideas about empathy, trust, you know, whether they are in the society we give and we grow up in somewhat different on average in men and women, huge ranges within men, huge ranges within women. So, but it's a sort of fun thing to explore. So let me end with something that's much more uh, 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 difficult and disturbing, uh, but another place where imaging is giving us insights that we could not have imagined having some time ago. So this is a very difficult case. I don't know if any of you have gone through it. I don't wish it for you. Many of you, some of you probably have, and many of you will sometime in your life, when you have to make an end of life decision. And amongst the most famous of these cases, uh, oops, sorry, was, um, 
Terry Schiavo. Now, I don't know if you, and that name even rings a bell for you, but it got very, very famous amongst these kinds of cases. So she had a cardiac arrest. She took a lot of diet pills, and that may have contributed. In February 25th, 1990, she went into a coma and then a vegetative state. So a vegetative state is when a person seems to be kind of awake, but when you talk with them, they're not very aware. They're not responsive. They're not noticing. They're not talking. But their eyes are open and they're awake. Their eyes are not closed. So that's what she is. Uh, and they put in her a, a feeding tube because without that, she wouldn't live. She couldn't uh, uh, eat and feed herself. It was a heartbreaking difference of opinion between her husband and her parents. Her husband petitioned uh, by, uh, uh, some years later, actually eight years later, to remove the feeding tube and let her pass away. The parents opposed that. They said that's not her wishes. She would want to keep on going with the feeding tube. The husband said, no, I don't believe that's her wishes. So you had this very tragic confrontation between the parents who loved her and the husband who presumably loved her, having different ideas about what uh, to do with her, whether to end her life or not. So finally, her tube was removed. But then the parents went to court, and the judge reversed it, and they put the tube back in here. She became, sadly, a kind of back and forth, uh, uh, living, non-living, on judicial decisions. Her, face, her case became particularly famous uh, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, and they, it went back and forth from court to court, you know, moving up into state courts. And, and there were several sup US Supreme Court decisions about whether to remove the tube or keep the tube in. And you know, tra it's a tragic thing. It's a tragic choice between the parents and the husband. It got to the US Congress and the US Senate. President Bush signed a bill to keep her alive. Okay, I mean, it was the highest. Everybody got involved uh, with various opinions. Uh, finally, the Supreme Court made a series of decisions. She, it, was her, it was disconnected in 2005, and she died in March 31 of that year. So a tragic, difficult decision and a tragic family situation that became kind of a political and judicial football. So what's going on in the mind of somebody like this, and how can we even begin to interpret it for a person who can't speak for themselves and can't respond? So let me tell you about a different case. We don't know her case. Uh, uh, so here... Again, a vegetative state is, is one where you appear to be awake, but there's no sign of awareness. Eyes are open, but the person's not talking or responding to anything in their environment. So here's a different woman, 23 years old in 2005. She had a road traffic accident, severe traumatic brain injury. Five months later, she's unresponsive, but she has preserved sleep wake life. She's waking up, going to sleep, waking up, going to sleep, eyes open, but unresponsive in every other way. They put her into an fMRI scanner, as well as healthy comparison people. And they have them do two mental imagery tasks, okay? Now, because, and they can't give instructions. They read instructions to the her. But here's what here's, you go into the scanner, and you're told to imagine two different things, playing tennis. So imagine in your mind, I, you playing tennis for a moment. Imagine that. Or imagine visiting all the rooms of your house, starting with your front door in the house that you are living in now or where you grew up. Imagine those two things in your mind. Now, first of all, just at a pure cognitive neuroscience level, and we'll come back to that, Imagination is a really interesting thing. And it turns out when we imagine things, again, we use the parts of our brain that does them. Imagination is perception run backwards. We can see imagination in the human brain. And depending on what you're imagining, you use the same systems that you uh, see with. If you imagine something you're looking at, you know, it will turn on your visual system. And it's even more specific than that. So let's first look at what happens with the controls. When they imagine they're playing tennis, they turn on the supplementary motor area that's a part of your brain that plans your physical movements. Okay, you're not moving, but you're thinking about it. This is imagination of movement. When you plan a movement, you turn that on. When you go around your house, you turn on spatial areas that are uh, in the parapocampal cortex and in a similar area, parietal cortex and parapocampal cortex, that are turned on if we show you a movie where you're moving around in spaces. If you see spaces, you turn those on. If you imagine spaces, you turn them on. So imagination in the brain is perception run backwards, or physical action run backwards. You're not actually doing it. But look at this patient who got in the scanner, who's non-responsive. You read her the instructions, and you see what she does. And look at her brain. Asked to imagine tennis. Asked to imagine the rooms in her house. And it looks just like that. What does that mean, just in a common sense? What does that mean? Did she understand the instruction? At some level, yes, right? She, she, she wouldn't turn on those parts of the brain if she didn't understand. Not only does she understand the instruction, she imagines the thing you ask her to instruct. So this got in the front page of the New York Times. The fMRI could tell you the internal mental life of a person who could no longer speak or communicate in any other way. 
Now, it's turned out since then that when they put in other patients into the scanner, most of them don't show this pattern. Okay, so it's not that every patient in a vegetative state is, is full of mental life like this person. And in a deeper way, we don't really understand what this mental life is like. We don't know whether she simply understands some things but doesn't have feelings or plans or desires or whether she has those two, okay? We don't understand really the full range of mental life, but we know, we know that she can understand an instruction and her brain follows through with it, okay? Most patients, it turns out, don't look like that in vegetative states. So again, brain imaging has taken us inside the mind of somebody who cannot communicate for themselves and let us say something about what it is that's going on in that mind. So in conclusion, we've talked about different ways of learning about the brain, different methods to record structure and function that vary in their temporal and spatial acuity, and you know, incredibly different ways in which we can understand the organization in time and space of how the brain supports the human mind. Thanks.